these men that we see, these talented political actors are everything despite what America has made. It's not yeah. because of, because America yeah. will like make you want to believe that, oh, pull yourself up by the bootstraps and you'll be able to make it. That is not true. The people that have made it and the people that they like to point to as paragons of political talent have made it despite what has been levied against them. Well, should we should we talk about uh, the Tennessee situation? Because I know a lot of people were commenting and it's uh, it's really it's kind of like crossing the Rubicon in a different way, at least when it comes to fascism. I don't know if anybody wanted to start or if uh, I know Blair was talking about it, but I can I can also open as well if you all want. Feel free to take it away. OK, so basically uh, after the Nashville shooting, there were thousands of protesters, mostly Gen Z activists that were marching in Tennessee. They marched straight up to the Capitol. They uh, had disrupted a session. And in solidarity with these protesters, there were three lawmakers who basically joined them. And they went up to the podium and they started talking about the need for gun control. And because they joined this protest, not even joined, just stood in solidarity with them and uttered positive comments about it, the right uh, is now labeling that as an insurrection. And now they were up for expulsion. Media was pushed out. In fact, Justin Jones, who was expelled, was filming just like the chants from the Gen Z activists outside. And on video, he caught one of his Republican colleagues just straight up assaulting him. Um, it's it's genuinely insane. They're very brazen. But um, now one of the three have been expelled. I think this is developing, so I'm not sure where we're at currently. And um, yeah, they were literally expelled just for saying that there should be gun control. Uh, it's it's unhinged. Like, I get that the uh, Tennessee Republican Party, they're against gun control. They've kind of gone in the opposite direction and deregulated even further. But this is this is like next level fascism. And there's a lot of protests right now in Tennessee and they're chanting, fuck you, fascists, because this is straight up authoritarianism here. Here's a speech from uh, Justin Pearson. Who I, it was either him who's been expelled or um, or the other Democrat. Uh, yeah, Justin then... Jones was expelled as far as I know. I don't know if Pearson is going to be expelled uh, or was expelled yet, but he he, was. he's up for expulsion. He was. No, they were both expelled. Both hmm. They were three people up for expulsion, uh, the two young black men and an older white woman, and they uh, voted to uh, not expel the uh, white woman. Who? Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's a message there for sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, the Republicans who made that decision <laughs> are sending a clear Pardon. message there, uh, just to be clear. <laughs> but also, we should also say that that um you know she she's come out and said that herself too the the woman who stood with them she was asked why do you think um you weren't expelled and she said uh maybe it's just the color of my skin like she's calling mm. it out too so good for her um i did read though that there's going to be a special election and they will be allowed to run again like they're mm -hmm. not banned from running and if they run again and win they cannot be expelled again for the same thing like that's it mm. so it's possible that these Tennessee Republican lawmakers just, uh, uh, you know, how Republicans were going crazy this past week about how we've turned Donald Trump into a martyr. I mean, they may very well have actually done that with these two young men. Uh, these mm -hmm. two guys are, are going to have a, a, a big future, I think, in politics for sure. Yeah, yeah. this, this and, speech is, is uh, really good. Let me just play this clip. We and you are seeking to expel District 86's representation from this house in a country that was built on a protest. In a country that was built on a protest. You who celebrate July 4th, 1776, pop fireworks and eat hot dogs. You say, to protest is wrong because you spoke out of turn, because you spoke up for people who are marginalized. You spoke up for children who won't ever be able to speak again. You spoke up for parents who don't want to live in fear. You spoke up for, for, for Larry Thorne who was murdered by gun violence. You spoke up for people that we don't want to care about. 
in a country built on people who speak out of turn, who spoke out of turn, who fought out of turn to build a nation. I come from a long line of people who have resisted. They're great. Justin Jones, if you watch any of his speeches, they're incredible. It's clear why they made him a target because he it's not just this issue. Like he has been holding uh, the Republican Party accountable and really standing up for his constituents and representing Gen Z uh, in a very loud way. And so they wanted to find some excuse to get rid of him because he's been a thorn in their side. And they did. Like, it's not just this issue, like gun control, like on LGBTQ plus issues, uh, when it comes to, um, you know, uh, welfare issues. He is excellent. So these are two people who are leaders and they don't like that they're leaders. They don't like that they're able to set the agenda because that's what they want to do. They want to monopolize discourse and they just try to find some way to, to undemocratically remove them. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I mean... I'm not surprised. It's just a reality. We can't constantly recognize that the Republicans are fascists at this point. I say it every episode. Like, yeah. this is the kind of extremism. This is not at all surprising. Um, and I would like, in a in a different world, you want to. And I, first of all, yes, that speech is incredible. He's clearly an incredible speaker. Um, and in a different world, you'd like to be like, oh yeah, he'll have a great career in politics because you see how talented he is or what, how great of a speaker he is. But in this world where he's a black man in that environment where those kind of powerful white supremacists have it out for him so bad that they would remove him, I think I worry about his safety long term. And I think that's something that doesn't get, you know, I feel like, you know, mainstream media will never will never delve into that read that part of it, because to delve into that would have to be to recognize the kind of dangerous forces these people are with the kind of things they've done, historic things and the reality of that. And, you know, it would change the tenor of the very like both sides, ah, the way people try to treat politics. Um, but a real thing is his, his safety. Honestly, that's that's something that I, you know, I, I I think about that in, in a situation where where people have targeted him as somebody that is a leader, as somebody that they, they need to get rid of, as somebody that they would go to these links. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I hope he stays covered. Yeah. I have to give credit. Is, this yeah. is um, this one. This is uh, Jones. I can play this as well if you want. Yeah. We are brought to here where members are responding in the most extreme measure, not because of what we did, but because by breaking the quorum, we broke the glass of your false power for the world to see. We broke the glass of this chamber that someone called sacred. One of the members on the other side of the aisle was in tears and said, I've never seen such a breach of this sacred chamber. And I thought to myself, that representative has obviously never read history. Because is it in this chamber, if you walk around this Capitol, you'll see bullet holes when representatives got into conflict. You'll see duels take place on this House floor, debating whether people like me should be treated like equal citizens under law. This is not a temple. This is a place where we're supposed to wrestle for our democracy and wrestle ideas and give voice to 78,000 constituents each of us represents. But for so long, this body, drunk with power, has modeled for the world what we know as nothing less than authoritarianism. And today is the climax of that behavior. That a week after a mass shooting plagued our community, the most direct action this legislative body takes, or should I say my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are taking, is to expel us for speaking about the issues of weapons of war on our streets. Let's talk about expulsion. For years, one of your colleagues who was an admitted child molester sat in this chamber, no expulsion. One member sits in this chamber who was found guilty of domestic violence, no expulsion. We had a former speaker sit in this chamber who is now under federal investigation, no expulsion. We have a member still under federal investigation, no expulsion. We had a member pee in another member's chair in this chamber, no expulsion. In fact, they're in leadership. 
in the, in the governor's administration. And so once again, what you're saying to us, since you're trying to put us on trial, I'll say what you're really putting on trial is the state of Tennessee. What you're really showing for the world is holding up a mirror to a state that is going back to some dark, dark roots. A state in which the Ku Klux Klan was founded is now attempting another power grab by silencing the two youngest black representatives and one of the only women, Democratic women in this body. That's what this is about. Yeah, it's like, they're incredible. They're incredible. But when I see incredible black men in this context doing this, I can't help but recognize all the times I've seen incredible black men in that context doing that. And we are talking about them in what ifs and what could have been because past tense, because they're killed. They're, they're targeted and killed. Like, um, so that is, I, 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 like I say, I, and I think that's something, you know, we forget sometimes how different different environments are for protests. And like people could take that for granted, like as for, for what New York City is and what NYPD is, there's still a big difference between protesting a Black Lives Matter in, in Manhattan versus what it is in Mississippi. Like there are serious things. Like when I've talked to different like organizers on the ground and different activists and stuff, following the different deaths of different black people, depending on what they are, there are far different constraints of what the danger is locally in those places and those environments. And the internet sometimes can blend the world in a way where we don't really realize like what the outside environment is there, right? Like that might be going viral on Twitter and we're like, oh my God, this person is amazing. This person is this, this person could be a great speaker and this person, but this person could be in, in their real life where they're at, they are a target and they are a person that has a lot, a lot to, to be concerned about or in, and are in danger. So when I see um, two black men and a woman targeted on this level to where they have to give a very moving speech like that because I don't know when last I've seen either a speech to the level of either speech they've given. It makes me, it makes me, you know, worry for them and hope for, you know, that they are covered and protected. And yeah, that's that's my that's my thoughts on that. And and like a really the the point is also because people would have you believe that Alime is being hyperbolic with this, but it is actually <laughs> it is actually very tempered and a reasonable response because every black resistance movement especially in the continental usa has been either co-opted or just absolutely obliterated we think of black wall street we think of i saw people mention fred hampton mlk uh, Mark oh, it. it's it's a constant it's it's not like this is not um and in the same way uh when people are talking about um, the trans genocide that is happening and using those words extremely purposefully, it's because it exactly is. This is not hyperbolic. Like, this is not Fox News trying to say it's overblown, it's a psyop or something like that. This is, in fact, maybe um, me like not even speaking to the level of severity we need to take it to. And everything that Black talented political orators, people with political talent like that, um, people made mention of of the the way that they spoke and the the cadence being extremely religious and and probably ecclesiastical and how they the matrix for it was probably a church and and when you think about that that's just so poetic because when we think about how the church as an institution is a place where they're able to develop these political talents at the same time they have to fight a litany of different aggressions, whether it be the colonial construct of church, all the different things that are said in church in order to break down black men in particular and socialize them into being a particular way, yet they still come out like this, which is my point that these men that we see, these talented political actors are everything despite what America has made. It's not yeah. because of, because America would like make you want to believe that, oh, pull yourself up by the bootstraps and you'll be able to make it. That is not true. The people that have made it and the people that they like to point to as paragons of political talent have made it despite what has been levied against them. So yeah. these men, if they, if, if they are able to actually realize their full political talent 
and get to the stages that they deserve to be on, it is not because of America. It is in spite of America. Big facts. Yeah. Round of applause. Clap track. Well said. <laughs> I actually have a clap track, but I'm not sure which button it is, so I don't want to screw it up. <laughs> I got an air horn, but I don't know if it's going to play. <laughs> Let's see if this, what's this? Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah. I guess right. There we go. You could have done like a laugh track, then it would have been completely inappropriate. <laughs> Rational national sense. There you go. That makes rational national sense. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's sad. And like yet again, like especially also like these protests, um, we were talking about the trans genocide. Like it's it's very it's not even eerie, it's it's extremely numb. Like when I was like hearing like Alami talk just now, like the tiredness, the lethargy that you see on her is because she's had to say it like a million times. Like this ain't new. It's almost like a like a like a broken record because you get tired, and that's exactly what they want. Like they want you to get tired of when I but listen, when when they let them babies die in Sunny Hook, I was just like, Look, America will never Oh yeah, I know. I feel the <laughs> same way never, once that they, happened. But, it was over. Like I was just like the gun yeah. debate. Like I say, you lost. Like could say they will, they will care more about their guns than their babies. They will. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have one more clip that's actually that's uh, a Pearson talking to the media. This is also uh, pretty good. And so every Tennessean needs to be very concerned that we are not in a democracy. And across the United States of America, there has been no House members who have ever been expelled for exercising their First Amendment rights in a peaceful protest. This is a first in American history. And we are losing our democracy to white supremacy. We are losing our democracy to patriarchy. We are losing our democracy to people who want to keep a status quo that is damning to the rest of us and damning to our children and unborn people. It is no coincidence that the two youngest black lawmakers in the state of Tennessee and one or two women are on trial today. That is not accidental. This is what happens when you lose democracy. This is what we are fighting against and must stand up against as legislators and as people and as citizens across this country. Because it's starting in Tennessee, but it won't end here. Excellent speakers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even the even the Afro, like all of it is is purposeful with that. Like and unfortunately black hair is very political, but like even a choice like that um you know you think of angela davis you think of the people that wear the they he knows what he's doing and the thing is he has to he has to perform these political markers in order to access even the rooms and the possibility of, of influence that he's able to access in so like all of these different qualifiers he's doing in order to to get into these rooms so i i i watch his career with a lot of veganness and also trepidation yeah, rightfully so. It's it's just really dark times now. And I think that people, they're starting to wake up to the fact that one of two parties, one of the only two parties in this country that are electorally viable is fascist. Um, and I don't think that they really understand what that means, because to all of us, it's kind of a foreign concept. Like we think about fascism back in history in World War II, and it's like inconceivable that that could happen here and that fascism could be on the rise here. But it's like we're well past this whole identification phase, uh, which is where I think some people are finally emerging. And we're into the implementation part of the fascism. Like you look to Florida and specifically the laws that are being proposed. And it is deeply authoritarian laws that require journalists to register if they uh, criticize the government. Laws that require uh, universities to um, report on, I, I can't remember the specifics, report on what they're covering, if they cover any social politics or critical race theory. Like, these are all the state seizing power uh, for fascistic reasons. You see the um, the way that they go after opposition in a very authoritarian and direct manner. Like, this is all part of fascism. Like, fascism isn't, like, one thing. It's a number of things. There's criteria. And as the years go on, we meet more and more criteria. Like, we, we check more boxes. And we're starting to realize what that looks like. It looks like transgenocide. It looks like the disempowerment of political opponents in an authoritarian way. Um, the removal of civil rights that have been fought for for centuries. I mean, Roe v. Wade being overturned, it hasn't even been a year. But that is monumental. Like to, to even 
recall that, oh, yeah, we're, we're back to pre-1970 America with regard to reproductive rights. That is no small thing. And for people who are kind of like in this privileged position to where it doesn't personally affect them, it will affect you eventually because one by one, like each group, like everyone is going to be touched by this in some way. Um, because that's what fascism does. It is the, like the takeover of power, of culture, of all institutions. And so like we're seeing that. And I'm glad that people are starting to wake up finally and acknowledge it for what it is and finally use the F word. But we're kind of uh, we're, we're past the acknowledgement phase, as I was saying, and we need to be in the mobilization phase to, to stop it if it's not too late. We will never bow to the mob, to the mob. Ever. ever, ever, no matter what. No matter what. Do you see the final expression of cancel culture in terrorist groups like, 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 up yours, up yours. We'll see who cancels who, who.